friends, and welcome back to the Rewind podcast of Forward Church. Join us each week as we take a look back on Sunday's message and dig a little deeper into the conversations with those who are teaching across our sites at Forward. We want to invite you to be part of the conversation too. So if something we're talking about on Sunday morning sparks a question in you, head to our website forwardchurch.ca slash ask us and submit your questions there. And we're going to do our best to engage with those questions in this space. With that said, let's jump in and get started. So welcome back again to a post-Easter wrap-up rewind podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Nunn, student ministry pastor here at Forward Church, also your uh, resident podcast host usually, um, and then our Kitchener site pastor slash online teaching guru now, after four whole weeks, uh, Derek Fuller. Hey, everybody. Welcome, Derek. So you had a, well, I guess it wasn't really a busy weekend. You had a very busy week. Yeah, well, so here's here's a bit of the timeline of what took place. Uh, I think it was the Saturday before Easter weekend. Uh, our production team, which are outstanding, a big shout out to uh, Ben Skinner and to Eric Silvera and to Keith Sparrow for all the work they did in putting everything together on Easter weekend. Uh, but they got on a call with me on Saturday afternoon. They said, we need to chat. And I thought, oh, okay, oh, no. <laughs> I had just recorded my message for that Sunday. And uh, they came on and said, so we're just looking at our production timelines and wondering if you would be available to do Good Friday on Monday afternoon and Easter Sunday on Wednesday at daybreak. Uh, I, at that point, uh, had nothing prepared. <laughs> so I said, sure, <laughs> I guess that's what we're going to do. So... Uh, <laughs> I, we had uh, literally just finished wrapping up everything for Easter weekend. Um, last week, prior to last week, us doing our rewind. Yeah, that's right. Together. So I just yeah. finished up all that and then jumped back three messages to, to chat with you about <laughs> message before. So it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a whirlwind. And you're not teaching this weekend. So your head isn't clear and wonderful. You've got nothing else on your plate. So nothing at all. I, I just <laughs> I'm sitting in this office, uh, twiddling my thumbs. So we got lots of stuff on the go, but I'm not, I'm not teaching this weekend. Right. Pastor Steve will be back up. Now you, um, you mentioned, uh, as we were sort of chatting, getting ready for last week's podcast. Um, and I shot you a message after good Friday, just being like, man, that was, I felt like that was such a beautiful, uh, it felt, it felt more like an experience than a sermon, right? It was just the weaving together of worship and message was just so wonderfully done. And you're like, thanks, man. We got a great team. And I think that was plan C or D on what we actually had in mind. So yeah, would yeah. you walk us through the development of that? Just yeah, you know, so we a crisis behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, we, we start planning for Easter services. We, we plan for a lot of stuff here at Forward, like quite a bit in advance. Um, and Easter is no exception. And so we had a plan worked out just after Christmas of what mm -hmm. we were thinking Easter was going to look like and what Good Friday was going to look like. And Good Friday was going to be based around, uh, it was, it was going to be more experiential in some ways uh, still, but it was going to be based around us coming together as the church around uh, the two elements, the bread that represents Christ's body for broken for us and the cup uh, that represents the new covenant, the forgiveness of our sins. And we were going to kind of break our teaching up into two parts and centered around that communal experience that totally wasn't going to work in our current reality and circumstance. Right. So uh, last, not this past Tuesday, so two, two weeks ago now, we were sitting down with our creative team realizing there's no way we're going to do this for Good Friday. What are we going to do? And I think we had Easter Sunday kind of still plotted out and ready to go. Um, but Good Friday was just that I needed to be totally different. So we talked and said, let's lean into the isolation of Christ in that moment. I think that speaks to where we are 
and we're going to go out to the Guelph conservation area and there's a long road down there. And we were going to have me walking down the road at various spots and walking through some passages, somewhat similar to some of the things that we did. And then we were going to have like four um, vocalists walking down that same road, appropriately socially distanced, right. recording them with the music in between. And then the word came down that the conservation areas and stuff like that, that may be just not a good idea either. We were going to shoot uh, Easter Sunday in downtown Galt uh, on one of the bridges as the sun came up. So we scrapped that location and moved it to my backyard. Um, so there was still, yeah, there was still a lot of moving parts moving around. Yeah. And I'm sure some of that was like exciting and fun, but a lot of it was, uh, I'm sure, at least some, somewhat stressful. Yeah. So, um, you've actually answered a few of my questions here in sort of running us through what's happened. The, you know, how did you specifically tailor this Easter experience? Because it's been wildly different than yeah, not being able to gather. Just sort of, you know, I love how you started. You know, Easter hasn't been canceled. It felt a little bit on the front end, like mm -hmm. man, because it's so centered around gathering, but. Would you highlight anything else on how you guys specifically tailored it to the moment at hand? Yeah, well, I think the whole um, bringing it under the theme of hope um, mm -hmm. and remembering that we have a, a that Easter gives us a hope that transcends circumstances, and we recognize that we're in a moment where a lot of people are increasingly losing hope, yeah. like not even hope about when things may begin to go back to some sense of normalcy, right? Uh, there's yeah. just a growing sense of like angst and despair over that. So, but we celebrate hope. I mean, that's what we mm -hmm. celebrate. Um, that death is defeated uh, and that Christ is risen. And that celebration aspect for sure is in some ways muted because we're wired to want to experience life in the context of physical community. Yeah. And I think that's the absence we felt, right? Like, I felt that I, you know, I wanted to be with my church family desperately and I wanted to be with my family family as well. Mm -hmm. And all of those things were canceled, but Easter's not canceled. The hope we have in Christ isn't canceled. And so we wanted to communicate that hope on good Sunday, uh, on, on uh, Easter Sunday, on good Friday. Like I said, we want to lean into the isolation that Jesus mm -hmm. felt. And, um, and so even in how we were going to shoot it, the background and the setting that we were going to shoot it in, we wanted to create more of that sense of isolation. The weather was helpful in kind of the dreariness of the, the day as we were shooting. Um, but yeah, uh, at, at the end we celebrate, we celebrate because, uh, you know, my sin's been dealt with and my savior is risen. And that's the yeah. core of what we celebrate at Easter. Mm -hmm. And while the weather was helpful, the birds and the crickets were not. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So we use a shotgun mic, again, a little behind the scenes here. Uh, with a shotgun mic, you shouldn't be able to pick up much beyond what the what is right there where the person is standing. It was so loud when those frogs were going like i i, I was like there's there's no way i'm gonna be able to do this i can't i can't think <laughs> and and on and on the easter sunday morning we we were hoping for a sunrise we didn't quite get that but we were shooting it at daybreak and it was one degree outside and those birds were screaming and and i was freezing <laughs> well you didn't put on a coat like power no. I did wear boots because I knew you couldn't see them. So I had nice fuzzy <laughs> boots on. <laughs> now, the, the way that you guys walked through Good Friday, I just thought was so powerful. Like for me personally, like experiencing that, having not seen a lot of behind the scenes and prep and watched, you know, plans A through C crumble before your eyes. Mm. I just was overwhelmed. And it was the first time we as a church had actually seen people worship together. I know it was like four different screens or whatever, but like, man, that was such a, a beautiful moment. But in terms of like, um, like the exposition of passages, you didn't do a ton of that. It was really just walking through that story. So I, did, I didn't have a ton of like, let's dig further into that questions. But the one that really stuck out to me was the moment where, where Christ cries out and feels abandoned by the Father. And I just know that there's like 
deep theological implications if if there's a trinity and god is father son and holy spirit and then the father and the son are separated for a time does that dissolve the trinity how like um so i wonder if you would just like clear that whole thing up for us Derek. oh for sure <laughs> because it, it, here's why it's so tricky because we have two concepts that by default we can't wrap our mind around so the one is that, that you mentioned that god is uh, a trinity that in perfect relationships father son holy spirit one substance three persons that is the orthodox understanding of who god is that comes from scripture as we look at it on the other hand we have this reality of orthodox christianity that is the, the christianity that we hold to is the the foundation of our faith that's been passed down uh, from the apostles to us and that's that jesus was both fully god and fully man mm. and, and in on the cross in that moment we have those two realities tied up together yeah. and so i'm not and i i said this within this in a way that we can't wrap our minds around and fully understand there was a, a a abandonment of the son by the father now i think there's a couple ways that we can understand um how this works i mean first of all there is the forsakenness that that jesus was um socially forsaken mm -hmm. uh, and the father allowed that to happen to him and i and i tried to help us live in that as i took us through the narrative to see some of those ways in which jesus was all alone mm -hmm. his friends had left him uh those who were around him his enemies treated him with contempt they spit on him. Even the crowds walking by mocked and jeered at him. And so he was just utterly and totally socially abandoned by himself in that moment. Uh, there was an emotional abandonment that I, I didn't get to tap into as much, but I think is, uh, you know, really helpful for us to see uh, because uh, all of us have lived there in some point. Jesus is in the garden and he prays prayers that the father doesn't answer in the affirmative, right? Yeah. yeah. Take this cup from me. Um, he, he's in this reality before Pilate where he is the righteous one is, uh, is forsaken. The, the sinner is set free. Yeah. Um, so there's this reality that faithfulness in Christ seems to be being repaid with abandonment. And, and there's this sense in which as God seems far away, all of Jesus' enemies are so close. And, and I would call that kind of the uh, emotional abandonment or emotional desertion. And then there's that final reality that in some way, shape or form theologically, uh, God really did have to turn his way, his head away from the son. The father did have to turn his head away from the son because Jesus really is bearing our sins. Uh, the, the judgment that we are due really is being poured. The wrath of God is being poured out on that, on the person of Jesus. And he is suffering the weight of the isolation that we suffer being separated from God. And so he suffers that so that, a way can be made for us to come into the presence of God. And that's the, that is that incredible reality of in the moment that Jesus dies, the temple veil rips. Yeah. And that's the symbolism of we were separated from God, but now there is a way to enter into the presence of God through Jesus. But Jesus had to take that and deal with it for us to be able to enter in. Um, so that all of that is what's tied up in that, cry of abandonment that uh, that jesus cries out on the cross where he says my god my god why have you forsaken me and it's also uh it's taken directly out of psalm 22 jesus mm -hmm. is, is quoting scripture and and there's a whole bunch of moments in that psalm that are fulfillments of what takes place on the cross that day but if you go to verse 24 uh, the psalm ends with a cry of faith and hope and, and, and utter belief that uh, God has not actually abandoned 
uh, his people and he will, and they will be victorious in him and through him. And I think Jesus, as he quoted that, he knew his scripture. And so yeah. he, he understood even as he suffered all of that, he still lived in the reality of what was going to take place through this. Mm-hmm. And that's the movement of Good Friday to Sunday, right? Is that yeah. you, you highlighted so succinctly the hope that we have in Christ. And I loved how you just sort of broke down those different uh, elements of the hope that we have in Jesus. And you talked about, firstly, the, the living and the real hope. And it's not a, you know, <laughs> all of you said, it's not a lottery ticket kind of hope where I just like, ah, I'm, I'm squeezing tight. I'm rubbing my uh, rabbit's foot or whatever. Um, and you said, it's not a miracle hair growth. Yeah. Now you pointed at your own head. Have you, Derek Fuller, ever tried a miracle hair growth drug? And if it were, pass it along. <laughs> uh, I have not. I've worn a mullet wig uh, and various <laughs> other ways of put a giant. One of the beauties of, of having a fully shaved bald head is when you put on a wig, it looks fantastic. <laughs> uh, so I have I have tried on many different wigs. I like to do that for my family as I go into stores and see them. Uh, I have a very good friend who tried hair plugs. <laughs> He's gone back to having a bald head, actually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I've just stayed. I just embraced it. I've embraced it. This is now. 18 years uh, since I was 22 years old, I've had my head shaved and, and this is who I am. All right. All right. I've, I've gone down to the, to the one, but my next step is joining you in that club. So, <laughs> so as we talk more about uh, tangible hope and hope that, uh, you know, crosses lines of people who actually have hair. Uh, I just loved, uh, I loved how you talked about the, the reality of that hope, but I just wondered, um, no, I, I sort of, in my brain, I'm going to an apologetic bent in there, right? Like there's, there's things that are provable and historical facts that give us some security in the hope that we can have in Christ. Mm-hmm. What have you found either for your own heart or in conversations with skeptics to be uh, some of the most powerful apologetic either arguments or, or statements or, or things along those lines? Yeah. Uh, well, I mentioned one on uh, on that uh, Sunday, which is the the James brother of Jesus. I think that is a it like blows me away every time I read it. I can't get over. If you read scripture, you'll see there were moments where James and his and the rest of Jesus' brothers, his whole family, just thought he was crazy. Like thought he thought he'd lost his mind. Yeah. Certainly weren't buying into the fact that this is God in the flesh uh, come to dwell among us. Yeah. And yet something happens post his death that changes everything for yeah. James. Um, uh, we went to 1 Corinthians 15, and I, I think that's a crucial text when you're engaging people. First of all, you need to know this. It's probably uh, the text that, was, that we have that's written closest to the actual text. Uh, uh, death and resurrection of Jesus. Really? So you're you're about twenty or so years out at that point. Now that seems like long, but it seems a lot less long when you're forty years old like me, and you realize soon we're going to be at uh, twenty years from nine eleven. Yeah, uh, that means that what what Paul is what Paul then quickly goes to say is, uh, in case you're wondering about this thing that I say is the bedrock, right? And he says like I passed on to you what is of first importance. This is this is the bedrock of mm-hmm. faith that Jesus died according to the scriptures, that he was buried according to the scriptures, that he rose on the third day again according to the scriptures. Then he says, and here's what you need to know. Uh, Peter saw him. Uh, the twelve saw him. Uh, in fact, one time he showed up to five hundred brothers and sisters who saw him, and then he makes this statement: many of whom are still living. And right. functionally, what he's saying is. If you doubt this, take a walk over to Jerusalem, take a boat yeah. over to Jerusalem. You'll find a whole bunch of people who were there, who saw it happen, and they'll all testify to this reality. Yeah. I think that is a, that's a very important thing. The, the other thing that always gets me is if you read through the Gospels and you read, uh, you read the, just the description of the disciples and you walk in their shoes pre-Jesus death, yeah. and then you go to Acts, you've got to explain how this happened. 
you've yeah. got to explain how these numbskulls and cowards turned into these guys who are boldly declaring that Jesus rose from, and that's the totality of their message. Right. <laughs> you killed him. God raised him. Now say you're sorry. That's functionally <laughs> Peter's first sermon on the day of Pentecost. Like that's, that's what yeah. he says. Uh, and, and he stands there and preaches it to all these people when, you know, not much before that, uh, he had been running away and swearing at people who said, Hey, weren't you with Jesus? Yeah. And these guys go and they take this mission and, and, and most of them, apart from John, all of them die for it. Mm -hmm. And John, we, we tradition says, was uh, boiled alive. They couldn't kill him and then was sent to live on Patmos in exile for uh, the rest of his days. And so he so didn't get a free ticket. Did not get a free pass. They all were willing to go to the death for something that, uh, if it's not true, they knew was a lie. They got no benefits out of it. All they got was persecution and harm. Uh, I, I, I grabbed a quote here because this is emblematic. This is not a Christian, just a Christian reality. Like every credible Western historian says, hey, something happened here. So this is from Paula Fredrickson, who's written a bunch on it and, uh, and is not a Christian. She said, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say. And then all the historic evidence we have afterwards attest their conviction that that's what they saw. It's not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus, she says. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw. But I do know as a historian that they must have seen something. And I've gone through all of the other options of what they might have seen, what might explain it. All of them require greater faith than believing that Jesus actually did do what everyone said that he did. So that's that's it for me. Yeah. And I think... Uh... I've, I've heard it said, and I can't even remember who the quote gets credited to, but the greatest apologetic in our day is a transformed life. And I think that's what you see, you know, just the other side of Jesus' resurrection as well as these folks who are idiots, basically like post or pre-resurrection are absolutely transformed. And you get, I think it's Acts 4 where it says uh, Peter and John were ordinary unschooled men who had been yeah. this, right? But just like, yeah. how are these guys doing this, right? There's yeah. a sense that it's got to be Jesus and only Jesus. Yeah, it's a, and it's transformed lives that transform the world. Mm -hmm. uh, e even early on in the story, uh, I think it's Acts 17, where they, they are looking for these guys who have turned the world upside down. Yeah, yeah I love um, And I love that line too, yeah. Yeah. Um, so then you moved on saying, hey, this, there's a hope that's not contingent on, uh, on our behavior, but it's on, it's on God's character and his steadiness. And then you created this spectrum of people who had been like, uh, you know, I'm right uh, to like, God could never forgive me. And I'm just like, I know you as a friend and a pastor, like you engage with people like often from outside of faith lines, right? Like you love to be talking to people who haven't decided that they're even going to step into a church, whether, whether or not they're going to follow Jesus. Have you found one of those two ends of the spectrum to be more difficult to engage with people on or the, on one or the other? Uh, I have um, each provides its own challenges, but for me, there's no doubt that those who don't, uh, <laughs> who think that they're all right on their own are by far the toughest. Mm. Um, nothing is more difficult to combat than self-righteousness. And, and functionally, that's what you are when you say, I'm pretty good on my own. I don't, I don't yeah. think I need God. I am self-righteous. My righteousness yeah. is based on myself. Yeah. And we tend to think of religious people as being self-righteous there's plenty of irreligious people that are self-righteous. I mean, th there's a tendency for all of us to lean in that direction. They were the people that Jesus had the hardest time. Yeah. The only yeah. time Jesus loses his cool and, and is with the self-righteous Pharisees that he's dealing with. And, and I really think that that's out of love. Like mm -hmm. I, I know that's out of love. I know the character of Jesus. It's like he, he knows that, they're not going to hear anything he says that has to deal with somebody 
who isn't in a right relationship with God because they assume they are. So he has to just basically take them and shake them to say, no, you are not in good shape. Your, you, your hope is in the wrong thing. And I desperately want you to, to know that because if you don't, you're in massive trouble, right? When you have somebody who already is living the bad news, <laughs> to hold out the good news is, is like water and, right. and air for, for somebody who's struggling to breathe, right? But the good news can feel like bad news to somebody who already thinks their life is good news. Um, It it feels like, how dare you condemn and judge me? I'm not condemning and judging you. I'm telling you where you already are. I'm trying to make you aware that you're drowning so so you will grab on to the lifeboat that's been put out there for you. But if you're not going to realize you're drowning, I can't help you. Yeah, I wonder if this this moment in history that we find ourselves in just provides us, you know, it's, it's almost as though the circumstances of a life have kicked the stilts that our self-righteousness has been built on. And, and now we have an opportunity to say like, Hey, no, we're all like fragile and in need of a savior. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, th- I think that has been part of what God is doing in this season. Uh, he's been rocking the security that a lot of us have uh, found are hoping to say, mm, there's not really any hope there. And I don't want you to get through the end of life believing in a false hope. Yeah. Yeah. Again, gracious, what feels difficult could be actually a gracious move of God. Um, you talked about how, you know, when, when people are doing that, they're being self-righteous. They sort of, they go to the bar. They're like, I'm not Stalin or Hitler, yeah. right? Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a real, you could roll over top of the bar like this for ourselves it's never i think you said mother Teresa. yeah billy graham why do you think we do that uh i mean right uh oh i lost you there andrew i lost you there i said we know that that's a junk argument right like i nobody can can say that and feel good about that i i i i don't know if we do know it's a junk argument uh Uh, Again, I think that we are self-righteous by nature. We justify ourselves by nature and, um, and we're proud by nature. Hmm. Um, You know, that's, that's at the heart of what is that drives our fallenness is our own pride. And that's come straight out of the garden. You know, that, that was the first sin is that, uh, Adam and Eve both wanted to set themselves up in the place of God to determine good and evil. And I think we continue to place ourselves in those places. And so then we see other people and we think, oh, come on. Like there's people that are way worse than me. And it's, and again, you're right. We always pick the people. It's like, yeah, but those people are in jail. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, there's also lots of people who are way better than me as a human being. And, and, and you're in a risky position if you're going to say that you hope that God grades on the curve because you don't actually know where you fall on that curve because right. you, you haven't lived the lives of 7 billion people. And, and how many out of that 7 billion people make the cut? Like what, what deserves an A plus and, and how many get a C and what's a failing grade? Right. Uh, I think that's a risky spot. Like, I don't understand how you can have any confidence living in that type of reality. Hmm. Now, to sort of attack this conversation from a different angle, you pulled a, a verse out of James, James 2.10, yeah. um, talked about how, you know, if someone breaks one law, they're guilty of breaking the whole thing. Now, theologically, I agree with that. But if I'm somebody standing on the outside of faith, I'm like, that seems super unfair to me that like God would hold out all these laws and then you break one and the whole thing crumbles for you. How would you respond to my hypothetical self in that situation? Uh, I would respond a couple ways. Let's assume that there's only 10 laws. Let's say they're the 10 commandments. Hypothetically. Hypothetically. I could probably walk you through the 10 commandments and show you how you violated every single one of just 10. Right. Then you can go down to say, well, what if there was only one law? Well, they had one rule in the garden. 
They didn't manage to keep <laughs> that either. Yeah. Functionally, <laughs> we, you know, I, we, we fall into that spot of like, well, you know, if I only break one law, again, we get into that comparison game, right? Mm -hmm. How, how many laws? Yeah. yeah. Functionally, the problem is that at our heart, we are rebellious sinners. That is who we are apart from the saving, sanctifying work of Jesus in us. So it's a mugs game because you're, you're never going to break just one. Right. <laughs> you're going to break them all. And, but a holy God can't look upon sin, period. That's the reality. God is holy and pure without sin. All sin is rebellion against the cosmic king of the universe. Right. It's, it's cosmic treason. And, right. and treason as a rule that's broken in every context and culture always has been given the death penalty. Right. Yeah. It's a single act of treason, which is going to cost you. Yeah, but it never ends with one anyhow. So, right. you know, we, we're getting into a whole hypothetical when we go down there because I could show you how you've probably broken every major commandment that God has given you. With the non-hypothetical, Andrew, for sure, you can do that. Hypothetical, <laughs> Andrew, might argue with you more. <laughs> All right, you, you moved on to say that this hope we have is like a secured inheritance. And I loved how you pulled the Gates family into that. And it's like, yeah, I just wonder if they're ever like stressed out about how the, what the future holds for them. I was like, that's such a, like, such a tangible example. I was like, no, I get it. I get it, Derek. So I just wanted to be like, great. Like you hit me right in the heart with that one. <laughs> and then you ended talking about that verse and it talks about these various trials. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered in this particular season of life, I think various trials is a, a great term because we're dealing with a great like variance in what people are struggling with right now. Some people are financially secure, but relationally desperate right now. And some people are on the opposite end of the spectrum. There's got great times with their family because they're not able to work, but that means they're getting in a financial pinch. I wondered if, you know, just for those of us who are followers of Jesus and, you know, geared up and committed and ready to go and serve in his name, what are some of the, the most uh, pressing and are there like trends and what you're seeing pastorally in this season? Yeah, uh, there's a few few big categories. Um, one is loneliness, um, you know, and it doesn't have to be just a single person living on their own. I think there's a lot of people who suffer uh, loneliness inside their homes, and loneliness around people can be more devastating. Mm. Just a feeling of disconnection yeah. uh, from people. Uh, and it might be because the people you felt most connected to, you're not able to connect with right now. And it wasn't your family. And those are the people you're living with. Uh, fear is massive. That uh, expresses itself in worry and anxiety. But I also think increasingly amongst a lot of Christians and men in particular, I'm seeing it, it expressed as anger. If you're feeling a high level of frustration and anger and you can't put your finger on it, it's a good chance that that is actually a symptom of anxiety and worry and fear that is going on in your heart. And I know a lot of us as men in particular, we don't like to think that we're fearful at all, but there, there's a lot of fear. Uh, and I see it coming out in anger against uh, be, because it's kind of nebulous. We need to find sources to place it on, right? So it's coming out against the government. If you feel the need to constantly post stuff on social media, <laughs> bashing government leaders, there's a good chance you're actually really struggling with fear and anxiety right now. Yeah. And you need to deal with the, what's going on in your heart or conspiracy theories. I, I, <laughs> there's a lot of, there, there's been a lot of 30 day pauses going on in my social media feed. Uh, at the current moment. <laughs> if you are posting conspiracy theories, I'm pausing you for a moment because I want to still love you at the end of this. <laughs> right. You're in timeout though. You are in timeout for this moment. <laughs> You're in timeout. That is not, it's not helpful to your soul. It's not helpful to the people that you have influence over and you, everybody has influence. Think about how you're using your influence. Okay. Uh, so I, we're seeing, we're seeing that the fear, anxiety, uh, and again, all of those things put pressure on family dynamics that sometimes people already knew were strained going in. Um, and uh, 
some people are discovering that there was fault lines that busyness covered over in the past. Mm. Um, so we're seeing a lot, uh, and we've got some marriage, uh, Kevin's, Kevin and Jen are going to be leading a marriage thing through Alpha Marriage. It's going to be great if you're kind of working through some stuff with your spouse right now. And I just encourage you to tap into that. This might be a season where God is raising up some things that were already there and unhealthy under the surface and now giving you some time actually to mm-hmm. fix that crucial relationship. Um, yeah, parents and kids, the, the job loss thing, uh, I think we're kind of in a holding pattern on that right now because of some of the things that the government uh, has put in place and people are waiting to see how that's going to work out in their finances long term. But certainly there's a, there's a, still a sense of anxiety that comes out of that. Yeah. Uh, and then there's all the regular stuff. Like life continues to go forward uh, and all of the crises you were struggling with didn't go away because a new crisis came up. Right. They're yeah. still there and this is laying on top of them or they're laying on top of it. And usually they're being exa- exacerbated by it. So. Yeah. So I'd say to those who find themselves in any of those categories uh, that you just laid out there, head to uh, Forward Online. That's where you can jump into, you know, marriage classes. I know they have CAP classes that they're starting soon, which is really just like like one-on-one coaching or you as a family getting some coaching on some financial stuff. You can jump in on either the get help or give help um, stuff that we're doing there. So if you're, you know, you're one of those people geared up, ready to go and serve in Jesus name, jump on that give help. And I know Chris is coordinating a bunch of that right now. Um, or you're in a place of crisis and we can be uh, a healing bomb or the presence of Jesus in that, then jump on there. Cause, uh, uh, there's some parenting stuff too that yeah, I'm pointing yeah. towards that Kristen and Neil are doing. If, you, if you're struggling right now with the, the reality that you're now trying to help your kids through online learning, uh, they did a great panel session. You can find it uh, on our Kids Town Facebook page, and we're going to try and get that out a little bit more broadly with a bunch of educators just to talk you through that and to hopefully kind of ease some of your fears and anxieties and help you just mm. release some of this stuff. So yeah. you got, you and I both have a, a gem in our pockets there because Amanda's yeah. a high level teacher. Laura's was a teacher and now is homeschooling our kids. So we're, uh, we're sitting on some gold mines there. You and I. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and email us, you know, contact us directly. Like uh, it's not just resources out there, but we as a staff are here as a resource to care for you and, and love you and shepherd you. There, There's people you can phone to the church office still, and we'll get you in touch with the physical person on the other end. Um, you, you don't need, you, we're here for you. That's what we want you to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the live chat function on our Ford online, you can jump in and, chat with somebody right away as well there too yeah so i think that's it if we lay out those resources thanks again derek for your ministry to us this past weekend i know it was challenging and ever shifting um but i believe god used you and the tech team and the worship team so powerfully over the weekend i've been uh, really thankful for you and the team that we get to work with here at forward uh and to you guys who've been continually generous um and loving and serving in jesus name and holding the body together in this time while we're separate but still finding ways to cross those lines digitally it's been it's been amazing from our vantage point to watch you guys love and serve so thanks for joining us here on rewind we will see you again next week if you've got any questions for church slash ask us if you want to throw those questions in and we'll deal with those here until then we'll see you next week